Because of this law and because of today's decision, millions of Americans who I hear from every single day will continue to receive the tax credits that have given about 8 in 10 people who buy insurance on the new marketplaces the choice of a health care plan that costs less than $100 a month. There you go. It might, uh, those subsidies might be necessary considering the exploding cost of Obamacare. At least that's what some are predicting. That's a great place to start this edition of our roundtable. Please welcome in radio host and former advisor to Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid, Ari Rabin-Hoth, and also joining us is political and economic analyst, the CEO of Gladius Consulting, Raul Moss. Gentlemen, it's good to have you with us. Great to have you. All right, all right, give us your take here. Now, we are also hearing today, in addition to this big win for the president, uh, that it's becoming harder to find a doctor because of Obamacare, and also prices are going up. Defend the law. Um, lots more people have health care, and uh, the fact is that, l that according to every major study done by every major group, people are paying less money for it, and threats about about trouble finding health care, et cetera, have always been greatly exaggerated when presented by conservatives. More people have access to health care. There's less uninsured in our country. The law is working, and today's Supreme Court decision was the obvious outcome of a pretty silly case. All right, Raul, let's get your take on this. Listen, uh, first of all, um, somebody's paying for it. You know, it may not be the individual who is receiving the benefit of these subsidies that's paying for it, but the American people are paying for it, and health care costs continue to skyrocket. Um, it was a fallacy to begin to believe from the very beginning that you were suddenly going to insure tens of millions of Americans that were not previously insured and that it really was going to be budget neutral or was going to have a minimal effect because we were going to drive the cost curve down. That simply hasn't happened. This was a bad law that basically puts the federal government so in charge of health care as opposed Raul, to... Raul, are you saying the CBO is lying about the cost of, of Obamacare? Because they say it's, well, it's not Ari, let me, neutral, let me get you, but it's let me, producing Hold on one second, Ari, because I want to get you to respond. I'm, I'm, I'm reading a story directly from thehill.com, which cites that report done by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and they say... In the Hill article, the number of doctors available in many health care plans is shrinking under Obamacare, forcing some patients to pay more or switch providers, according to that report. So which one are we going to believe, the CBO or the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation? Uh, I mean, I'll ask uh, John Boehner and Mitch McConnell staffers at CBO. I mean, look, the CBO doesn't get everything right, but they've been, uh, they miss sometimes, but they're actually pretty good at estimating costs, etc. And look, here's the thing. If Obamacare is such a failure right and it's so horrible here's my suggestion republicans can run a campaign on it and can win the presidency in 2016 and repeal it really simple if it's so unpopular you guys will sweep a new president into office and repeal it try running a, on a campaign on it it didn't work out too well for you guys in 2012 it's not going to work out too well in 2016. All right, just for the record, when you say you guys, you're not referring to me because I'm a registered independent. No, I'm but referring to Republican <laughs> I know, Republican I know. Party. I'm just trying to lighten it up a little bit. But Raul, go ahead. Weigh in here. Listen, I think, I think that's exactly what we need to do. And I think one of the things that the Republicans have come up short on, uh, although I see uh, the chairman of the GOP today uh, actually offering some alternatives, is, you know, there was no uh, administration backup plan uh, if the decision had gone the other way. And neither did the Republicans have a backup plan. So to a certain extent, the fact that things continued the way they are uh, has benefited both parties, because I don't think either one was prepared for a decision that went um, uh, the other way. Um, and so, you know, what I think we need to do now, I think Ari is absolutely right. I mean, the Republicans need to elect the new president, uh, need to come into the White House. And given the vast majorities that they have in both the House and the Senate, as well as in state legislatures throughout the country, we need to change this. I mean, well, let me ask you this. If we're going to wait for a Republican president here to, to change things, should Congress not do anything at all right now? Is that really a luxury they have? Um, look, I just don't know. At the end of the day, you know, you, you have the veto pen. Uh, I don't know if it's realistic to expect that uh, uh, we're going to be able to uh, pass anything during this administration that will stick. Um, and obviously, this has been a setback. There's no question about it, um, no matter how much you try and sugarcoat it. I think uh, Ari's right. Look, if we're going to do this, we need to defeat it legislatively. Uh, and, and that's the only way this is going get, to get changed. All right. Do you think the president would relish the opportunity to veto a uh, repeal bill should it come through the form of reconciliation? Do you think he would really enjoy that? I, think I don't would. think he'd enjoy it, but I think he'd do it. I, I think, think he'd he do. would. He, he wouldn't hesitate in a heartbeat. To no, do he it, wouldn't right? hesitate. But you don't think he would use that as an opportunity to to again flout the benefits of the law? 
Well, I, I'm sure he would. I mean, saying he'd enjoy videoing it, I think he enjoyed passing it. I think he enjoys the fact that millions of Americans have health care who didn't before. I think he enjoys the fact that, frankly, people have access to an exchange and there's an open market for health care in this country where one actually didn't exist before. I think he enjoys all those facts. I don't think he'd enjoy beating with, but I think he'd do it if he had to. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here coming up in a second. But before we go, I want to put up a graphic we have made of uh, the justices and how they voted or how they weighed in here. You see the six who went with the majority, including John Roberts, and the three who were dissenting, including Antonin Scalia. We had that up on the screen a few moments ago. We'll continue to talk about this, guys. We're going to get your take a little bit more on Obamacare and some other issues when we come back back. Ari Rabenhoff will continue to be with us, as well as Raul Moss. We're getting their take on what's next with the Affordable Care Act and what's Congress going to do, what's going to happen on the campaign trail in 2016. Our roundtable discussion continues right after this. Welcome back for part two of our roundtable. And joining us again is radio host and former advisor to Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid, Ari Raven Hoff, and political and economic analyst and CEO of Gladius Consulting, Raul Moss. Thanks for sticking around with us. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Jason Gruber. We've been talking about the Affordable Care Act. Of course, Gruber, one of the architects of the law. And just in case you forgot who Jonathan Gruber is, here's a reminder. Lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. And basically, you know, call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever. But basically, that was really, really critical to get the thing to pass. That's okay. That was Gruber back in November of 2014 when he accused American voters of being stupid. The Wall Street Journal recently published a series of Gruber's emails showing that he may have had a larger role in Obamacare than or he originally led on. Raul, what do you think about the Obama administration downplaying Gruber's role in the law now? Yeah, listen, I mean, I think it's clear that, that he, in fact, did have an, an enormous role. I think the emails demonstrate that. Um, I think, you know, this, this goes back to something that's been very, very troublesome in, in politics uh, uh, for quite some time, is, you know, whenever you try and ram something through, either by being deceitful, by not being totally transparent, or basically just ramming legislation through without any sort of consensus, uh, what you're doing is you're simply exacerbating this incredible void that exists uh, in uh, politics today in America. When you listen to the president speak about the lack of uh, uh, civility in Washington, D.C., you would swear that he was sort of talking as an outside observer who had absolutely nothing to do with the fact. You know, this, this angst that we're seeing politically, this whole argument over health care and so many other issues in this country are caused by the fact that, you know, this president has been less than transparent with the American people, has, been, has not sought any consensus whatsoever, uh, with the Republican side of the aisle. And as a result, you're seeing sort of this toxic uh, atmosphere that's been created in Washington, D.C., of which he is, at the very least, 50 percent responsible for. Well, Ari, now that the law has been again upheld or parts of it have been upheld by the Supreme Court, do you think now is a time for President Obama to talk about this issue with transparency or anybody from the White House? I don't understand what's not transparent. I think, look, Jonathan Gruber's job, let's be clear what those emails still say. Jonathan Gruber's job was was estimating the economic models that, that undergird, and by the way, not only the federal government, but a bunch of states with Republican governors also paid John Gruber for this, to provide economic modeling of health care costs. That's what John Gruber does. What's not transparent about Obamacare? What was What thing in Obamacare wasn't discussed before it became law? Let me... Let me remind people of something. Can I add there's something? A, there's I add? A Hold on one second. Our, hold there's, on a forgo there's a forgotten history here, which was the president gave Max Baucus months to work with Republicans in the Senate. Max Baucus tried desperately to craft a bill out of the Finance Committee with Republicans in the Senate. He tried over and over and over again and was given, frankly, more time than the president should have given him, and he couldn't get it done without with the Republicans. And the president moved forward passed a piece of legislation, passed it through uh, the House, passed it through the Senate, and it was signed into law. Well, clearly without enough people reading it, or the Supreme Court case would have never happened. Also, I'm thinking about what Nancy Pelosi said, that you'd have to pass the law to find out what is in it. Go ahead, Raul. Well, listen, uh, getting back to, you know, what part of the law wasn't transparent, how about the part of, if you like your doctor, you can keep it? I mean, that's the most self-evident, you know, uh, the description of this entire legislation. I mean, 
what an incredible lie. I mean, let's call it what it is, okay? There's been thousands what, of people... What's amazed me is how you guys, how conservatives and, don't and, care and about a lie that killed on, thousands of Americans that whoa, led into a war in Iraq, whoa, 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 whoa. All right, we're talking about Obamacare here. That saved millions of lives. No, but it's all related. You guys, Obamacare has saved millions of lives. And if you want evidence for that, there was an op-ed in, in the Washington Post by the American Enterprise Institute, by a scholar there, who said, Obamacare should be repealed. People will die. That's okay. Uh, so you guys are, are so concerned about lies that led to a law that saved millions of lives, but you don't care about a, a lies that led to a war that Absolutely. killed hundreds of thousands of people. All the Republican aisle are basically looking for people to die. Is that what you're insinuating? I think that's, no, I'm that's quoting the, the American Enterprise Institute. That's the problem the with the think tank. atmosphere that we've created in which you can't I'm have quoting a... Your because you you basically accuse the other side of wanting to see people die. I mean, is that I'm the Republican? I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm quoting the American Enterprise Institute. Give me a break, for Christ's sakes. Okay, you Republicans I'm do not them want to see people die. Verbatim. Okay, Republicans verbatim. want the to see. The was called "People Will Die." That's Republicans okay. Want that to see is the title of his and on doctors in charge of their health care, not the federal government. It's that simple. And what we're seeing is the complete opposite. We're seeing a continued explosion in the growth of government. Okay, we're seeing the government basically mandating its decision making regarding health care decisions, and we're seeing the cost continue to skyrocket. All right. Well, let's let's wrap it up there. We, we mentioned that the onus now is on either the presidential candidates or members of Congress or the Republicans to come up with some sort of alternative. And we can imagine uh, that this debate will continue through November of 2016. And gentlemen, we thank you for giving the American public a little preview of what we can expect out on the campaign trail, at least during the general election. Uh, good to have you both with us, even though obviously there's a huge disagreement on what happens next with Obamacare. I, Raven Hoff and Raul Moss, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.